Hello, my name is Danae Doris and I am the project manager for the American Clearinghouse on Educational Facilities. I would like to thank you for listening to our podcast today entitled Bridging Students, Educators, and Designers for Educational Facilities. ASEP is the Educational Facilities Clearinghouse funded by the United States Department of Education established to provide technical assistance, training, and resources to public early childhood schools, K-12 schools, and institutions of higher education. ASEF provides resources on facility planning, design, financing, construction, improvement, operation, and maintenance. We invite you to follow ASEF online at acefacilities.org and also encourage you to join the network of professionals already following the educational facilities discussions on Facebook, Twitter, and Blogger. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter for today's podcast, Dr. Judy Harris-Helm. Dr. Harris-Helm currently serves as an educational designer for early childhood centers. Previously, Dr. Harris-Helm has served as an educational designer for community learning centers, served as an associate professor for teacher education, and served as a public school teacher. Again, it is my honor to present to you Dr. Harris-Helm. Thank you, Dr. Helm, for sharing your expertise with our audience today. Hello, my name is Judy Harris Helm. I'm an educational consultant who assists elementary schools and early childhood centers in the implementation of best practices. In my role, I often bridge the gap between educators and designer builders in the school design process. Today, I'm sharing with you what I have learned about school design. Hopefully, it will be helpful to those involved in this process. There is no one school design that is right for all children in all communities. If there were, we could just copy it across the country. Instead, a good school design requires a complex process of joining the expertise of educators to the expertise of design and construction professionals and combining that with community needs. The result, when done well, is a school building that matches the vision of the school and community and one that will change and adapt to future needs. Unfortunately, the process sometimes results in a litany of miscommunication, change orders, broken schedules, cost overruns, and a building that's outdated before it is even open. My goal is to help you avoid the pitfalls by developing a clear understanding of the expertise and roles of educators and design professionals in the school design process. I will talk about key decision makers and stakeholders to include in the process, key concepts and key vocabulary, what happens in a typical design process, and ideas for combining the expertise of the two groups to create the best design for your school. I organize this podcast around stories of my own experiences with schools and the design process. So here is my first story. I call this story, That Room is Way Too Small. It comes from my earliest experiences in school design. I was working with a group of educators on the design of a state-of-the-art early childhood center for children birth through first grade. An adult literacy program for adults required a sibling care room for the few younger siblings that accompanied parents. After a good deal of discussion, Drawings were completed, which were reviewed by the literacy staff and the principal. When walls went up, we toured the building. Walking into the sibling care area, moans arose from the principal and the teacher. This room is way too small. The design staff was equally dismayed that they had obviously not delivered what the client needed. Comments included, but this is the size on the drawings. You all saw this and approved it. I have no sense what that square footage really means. I can't tell anything from that square on that drawing. What we had was a failure to communicate. The designers were speaking the language of square footage and drawings. The education staff did not speak square footage and design charts. It was just as hard for those educators to understand what the designers were saying as it would be if they were speaking German or some other unfamiliar language. The story, This Room is Way Too Small, occurs much too often and is an example of authentic communication that just didn't happen. By authentic communication, I mean, what I think I am saying is being understood by the person who is receiving my communication, and vice versa. To finish that story, the change order was too expensive, the sibling care room never functioned well, and it was abandoned for a larger room and became wasted space. 
So why doesn't authentic communication occur as often as it should in the design process? One reason lies in what participants bring to the design differences, their expertise and roles. Educators, teachers, parents, and of course the receivers of education, students, have a primary role of either teaching or learning. Even the custodian's primary role is quality education. Architects, interior decorators, and construction staff, however, have a primary goal of designing and building. These groups have different educational backgrounds and even different vocabularies. I will tell you another story. My next story is, charrette? What's a charrette? Architects have a process for working with educators to determine needs. There are many ways to organize this process. Currently popular is one called a charrette or a charrette process. One day I was invited to sit in on an architect selection interview process. One architectural firm showed examples of beautifully designed schools, well equipped for 21st century teaching and learning. Describing what the firm would do, the presenter said they would conduct a charrette process over a four-week period of time. Later, behind closed doors and post-interview discussions by the selection team, I was stunned to find the firm ranked low because there was, quote, no plan for community involvement, or, quote, no way to involve a variety of stakeholders. Had those designers talked instead about their planning process of multi-day meetings and extensive involvement of stakeholders, which actually is what a charrette is, or had they used the term charrette and then clearly defined the charrette process, they probably would have been selected. And the result would have probably been in design exactly what the school wanted. Specialized words and vocabulary can cause communication problems. The word programming is a term that's used by designers that often confuses educators. Designers use the term programming, or creating the program, for the phase in the design process when the overall concept of the school building is developed. The resulting program includes square footage for various functions, criteria and preferences for building materials, and the vision of the building. When educators use the term programming, they describe what occurs within the building, such as subjects or courses taught before or after school activities or specific programs, such as a fitness program. Another story for you. One time I went to school to meet with the principal to talk about an upcoming programming process. The principal, in response to my statement that I wanted to talk about programming, had asked the teachers to bring teacher manuals, curriculum guides, and assessments to the conference room where they were piled on the table for me to use. On the wall was a large curriculum map. I had to thank him for their diligence, but explained that programming had a slightly different meaning in the design process although certainly related to all of that. We were not doing curriculum programming, but developing a document called a program, which would become an overall plan or a list of requirements to guide the rest of the design process. Words that can cause the most problems are those, such as the word program, that have general meanings for one group, but very specific meanings for the other group. The terms green building and sustainability are good examples of this. I have found that if you ask an educator if he's interested in a green building or sustainability, you will probably get a yes. However, sustainability refers not just to energy and water use or having space for recycling. Sustainable building design includes being environmentally responsible and resource efficient throughout the building's life cycle. A sustainable building design uses materials in the building that minimize life cycle environmental impacts, such as global warming, resource depletion, and human toxicity. Sustainability includes everything from choosing the site, the processes of construction, ongoing operation, maintenance, renovation, and planned demolition in the future. Sustainability also includes site selection and consideration of the reuse or rehabilitation of existing buildings on the site. There are considerable time and budget implications to consider when we choose sustainability. Terms such as sustainability or LEED certification always require precise explanations. Educators also use terms with precise meanings to them. 
Engage learning and 21st century teaching and learning are good examples. It is also important for educators to define terms. If engaged learning includes group project work, then space will be needed for committees and teams. Display areas will be needed for projects, and presentation technology will be important. Areas where students work in groups will require acoustic treatment to control noise. Another example of a term is technology integration. Are they envisioning a computer lab or pupil laptops? Here are some specific considerations for bridging the gap and increasing authentic communication that might be helpful. Number one, acknowledge everyone's expertise. Make a statement in the beginning of the design process that acknowledges expertise and invites participants to ask questions and always ask for clarification. Number two, avoid jargon. Do you have to use that term? Can you substitute by stating the meaning of that term instead? Number three, if you are using a term with a precise meaning, such as sustainability, define it. Number four, create a list of words or a glossary of frequently misunderstood words. Include a glossary in the programming process, in the program book, and with minutes. Number five, remember, square footage and design diagrams are languages. Not everyone speaks them. Use guidelines for room size. I now translate the size of a room on a drawing by equating it to a room they are currently familiar with. For example, I might say, this room is about the size of the kindergarten room in your school. Or an educator can do the same thing. A principal might say, I need this conference room to hold four more people than my current conference room, and I want a door connecting directly to my office. Number six, remember, a picture is worth a thousand words. An architect can make a quick informal sketch of what he thinks the educator is telling him. This will enable clarification and correction. Number seven, use constant message checking. Simply teach everyone involved to restate and clarify what they are communicating. Say, I think you said you wanted, that's a good way of rechecking. A good clarifying question is, can you tell me more about that? I call my next story, Crabby Toddler, or It Just Didn't Happen. Sometimes one party thinks that communication occurred when it did not. There is still a toddler teacher in the Midwest who talks about how she told the architect she did not want windows in a specific wall because that area would be for napping. She said she told them she needed to be able to darken the area and reduce noise. She said to me, I told them that this was important and they said they understood, but it just didn't happen. When things don't happen the way one or the other of the parties expected it to, the result can be disappointment, a less efficient design, and a negative impact on the learning experience. If you have ever dealt with a crabby toddler who needs a good nap, you understand this problem. Here are some ideas to avoid it just didn't happen in your process. Number one. Make written communication and documentation a habit that begins with the first meeting. Written communication is a key to a successful, satisfying design process and a successful school building. Number two, provide a process such as a sign-off or email response for stakeholders to review written communication and drawings. The crabby toddler could have been avoided if the teacher had a chance to review the design. Number three, Use written records to protect against delays when there are changes in personnel. Reading the previous decisions and looking at sketches brings new staff up to date. When a design process is documented and verified using some of these ideas, there are fewer unpleasant surprises for either the designers or the educators. I call this next story, Who Needs to Be at the Table? It is important to have the key participants in the life of the school involved in the design process, not just central administrators. In one design process in which I was a participant, a secretary was not included in the design process. This school also provided services to parents with many social workers, therapists, and other service personnel. The office in the old school was overwhelmed and the space barely functional. In the new building, enhanced services would make the office seem even more like Grand Central Station. Sure enough, once the new school opened, 
it was discovered that it was almost impossible for secretarial work such as data entry to get done. Within two months of opening, partitions had to be moved in and a small room that was planned for conferences and IEP meetings now became an office area. Of course, this is not a typical school office. However, that is the point. It was never going to be a typical school office. Had a secretary been part of the planning process, there would have been a better prediction of workload and of space needs. There is really only one simple solution to this problem. Number one, make sure those who are critical to the functioning of the school, and that includes secretaries, maintenance, and food service personnel, be included in the design process. I call my next story, what do you mean it's too late to change that? I once had a harried librarian say to me, I can't possibly take the time to think about how books would be arranged on shelves two years from now. I can't keep up with what I have to do today. Fortunately, I was able to share the timeline and convince her now was the time to make that decision. Many educators do not realize the relentless nature of the design and construction timeline of a building process and how decisions are made, are left unmade, are very difficult to unmake later on. It would be helpful here to provide a brief summary of a design process. The design process begins with the selection of the architectural engineering team and the first stage of programming. In programming, the project is actually built, decision by decision. A common vocabulary for the project is created and preferences and requirements are determined and built into the overall picture. Programming results in a written program usually accompanied by sketches. The schematic design phase builds on the program and a defined feasible design is created and shared in the form of schematic drawings. And in some cases, there's even a model. Educators can see what the building might look like and how they might function in it. In the next phase, design development, that schematic design is refined and fixed. Details are worked out, including the selection of materials and the engineering systems. This final design is used to develop contract documents and finally used for construction. Timing is important. The time for educators to have the greatest impact is during programming and schematic design phases. Paying careful attention to the details at each stage is what keeps the project on target, the budget in line, and ensures the vision of the school. Designers sometimes don't understand that schools also have a relentless timeline. This affects the time and attention available for the design process and to review communications and drawings. Often a school will want to do a planning process at the beginning or the end of the school because students are not in buildings. However, I have found that the demands on teacher time and administrators is tremendous during this time period. It's not the best time. Here are some ideas about timeline that might be helpful. Number one, schedule intensive planning during the less hectic time periods of the school year. Number two, provide release time for key players during the day to get quality work done. Number three, create a written timeline with a diagram or flow chart. Indicate dates and what decisions will need to be made when. Distribute this to everyone. Number four, when using phrases such as schematic drawing, remind everyone where this fits in the design process and the degree of finality of that stage. Number five, plan larger meetings of all stakeholders after school or on Saturdays to get input. Number six, change orders. The ability to change a plan after agreed on and bid must be made only through designated individuals. Everyone has to have a clear understanding of who can make them and why. Number seven, document decisions and create a paper trail. It takes time, but in the long run, this will save time and also it will save money. I have another story. This story is called, What Windows? The last phase of the process of design should be commissioning a process of post-occupancy training where the staff is trained to use equipment and the new environment. Unfortunately, this last stage is often omitted. 
Yet this lack of training on the purpose and the features of the building and how to use them can affect school achievement. I once did a walkthrough for a principal of a fairly new school building. The building was beautiful. Each classroom had large windows with window coverings which could control glare, but still enabled students to view outside and for daylight to penetrate. The designer had clearly understood the relationship between daylighting, school achievement, and student focus. I was appalled, however, to discover two rooms where teachers had covered the windows with bulletin board paper and a multitude of posters. Not understanding the reasons for windows or the effect on reading comprehension, these teachers had actually decreased their own effectiveness. A 30-minute training session could have solved this problem. My suggestion for this is very simple. Number one, make educational commissioning a priority. Provide orientation and training to all staff. This is not the place to cut costs. The last thing I want to share with you is my thought about vision. And the last story I want to tell is all I want is a bigger closet. When I ask teachers what they would like to see in a new building, the number one answer is a bigger closet. Once a teacher said, I am happy with what I have. Just build me the same thing with another closet. I found this very sad. The current school was 30 years old. I wondered if that teacher would be satisfied with a new kitchen like she had 30 years ago. I'm guessing no. We don't cook the way we did 30 years ago, and we don't teach the way we did 30 years ago. At least we shouldn't. A problem that can arise in a design process is that some educators who have not seen other schools or been involved in a design process previously have no idea of possibilities. Yet there is a wonderful opportunity to impact education when a new building is being designed. Any design process should start with new possibilities. This can be a review of recent research on building design and explanation of what we now know about learning in the brain which is how I like to start, our visits to new facilities. Everyone participating in the design process should have an updated vision of what education can be. Establishing a new vision provides not only inspiration for creative thinking, but also excitement about the changes to come. My last bit of advice is very simple. Take time to celebrate the accomplishment of building a new school. Those who have participated in the design process should be the first to see the new building. It becomes a perk for all their hard work, and they in turn become advocates within the community for a positive reception of the new school. A new school is a symbol of hope, of community commitment to education, and most of all, commitment to children in the future. That in itself is worth celebrating. Remember I am sharing with you only stories where the process went wrong. There are thousands of stories where the design process went smoothly. It is a wonderful experience to build a new school. Thank you for your time. May your design process result in great stories and wonderful outcomes. Thank you for listening to our podcast today entitled Bridging Students, Educators, and Designers for Educational Facilities. We hope that you take this opportunity to learn from the content presented and add to your professional knowledge regarding educational design. ASEF would like to extend a very special thank you to our presenter, Dr. Harris Helm, and to you for listening to our podcast today. We hope you will join us again soon. Please remember to visit our website at www.acefacilities.org to access other learning events and follow us on your preferred social media outlet. Please take a moment to complete the podcast evaluation at acefacilities.org we value your input and look forward to hearing your feedback.